Since the end of the last ice age, the English Channel has separated Northern Europe from the shores of Southern England. It has presented man with the challenge of crossing a relatively narrow stretch of water for the conduct of trade, diplomacy and war. Man has learnt to navigate its length, to grapple with its tidal currents and storms, to reach the North Sea, the Western approaches and beyond. The Channel is without doubt one of the most important shipping lanes in the world. Alors, ce qu'il faut comprendre, c'est que c'est une voie maritime extrêmement fréquentée, depuis toujours, voie de communication. En plus, il y a des îles, donc c'est quand même un lieu de passage pour que les gens puissent échanger. En plus de ça, c'est une zone maritime qui jouit, si on peut dire, d'un climat quand même qui est assez robuste, parfois même très compliqué l'hiver. Donc on peut imaginer qu'au fil des millénaires, il y a eu de très, très, très nombreux naufrages. Donc l'intérêt pour nous, c'est que se trouve ainsi consigné quelque part sous le fond de l'Europe du Nord-Ouest, sous le fond de la mer, la Manche, la mer du Nord, un très grand nombre de sites archéologiques qui sont de, autant de témoins de pages d'histoire immergées et oubliées. Voilà pourquoi cette zone maritime pour nous est extrêmement importante. Elle nous, elle nous, à nos yeux, elle mérite d'être protégée, d'être inventoriée et probablement de mener à un très grand nombre d'études qui seront certainement pluridisciplinaires et sur de très grand nombre de sites de Grande diversité chronologique. Many thousands of wrecks spanning centuries of time have been pinpointed in the English Channel. This rich source of history creates the basis of the archaeological Atlas of Two Seas, or A2S Geoportal. The heritage shared between the three nations that border the Channel and Southern North Sea, France, England and Belgium, is being drawn together on this website. Adramar, the Hampshire and White Trust for Maritime Archaeology and Flanders Heritage are collaborating to drive the project forward. Academics, archaeologists and students, indeed anyone on the internet, will have the world of maritime history at their fingertips. One wreck on the portal is the U-1195, a German U-boat from the Second World War. A brief description, links to other websites and images are displayed. This wreck was sunk in the last months of the war. By 1945, U-boat losses were catastrophic, with few boats making it back from their patrols. The U-1195 was no exception. Commanded by Captain Ernst Cordes, she was on her first active patrol. In the early hours on the 7th of April 1945, this U-boat fired a single torpedo towards a convoy of ships heading for the safety of Portsmouth Harbour. The torpedo struck the SS Cuba, a troop ship, which immediately began to sink. But the hunter soon became the hunted with a counter-attack by the Allied escort destroyers. The damage caused by the charge, which exploded forward of the conning tower, sent the U-boat and her crew to the bottom. This graphic illustrates the scale of the damage from what must have been a near or direct hit. The outer skin and the pressure hull itself were breached by the blast. The U-boat and her crew stood little chance of survival. The U-1195 now lies in 24 meters of water, her hull slowly deteriorating. She is testament to a past conflict and a monument to the men that died within her. The portal shows the locations of wrecks in the Channel and the Southern North Sea on one virtual map, but it also gives information on its submerged historic landscapes. These were the lands that were drowned as sea levels rose. Archaeologists from Flanders Heritage are investigating one such site under the sands of Ravaseda Beach, close to the port of Ostend. Today, German defences from the last war still overlook this coast, but in the Middle Ages, in stark contrast to the guns arrayed against Allied attack, this shoreline supported a more peaceful community of fishermen and their families. But a succession of storms and high tides swept the inhabitants from their homes and their land. In the early 1970s, the footprint of the village was still visible. Now, that too has been covered by layers of sand. Other techniques are being used to discover what lies deep beneath the surface, and this can only be done at the lowest of tides. So we're on Ravaseda beach in Belgium, and um, we're doing coring 
because in the 13th and 14th century there was a medieval fishing village here. And now it's all covered by the sand. And with the core rings we're trying to see how deep the sand goes. We're trying to see if there's peat um, present. We're trying to see how deep the clay goes. We're trying to see where those remains are. Um, the core ring is combined with the electromagnetic survey and you can see the quads there uh, passing by. So the, the quad bike is pulling a sensor that is making a, like an image with the magnetic field of the whole area on this beach where the 13th century village was situated, so 700 years ago. There was uh, storms and was washed away by the sea and the people were have, had to move back inland. And so we are going to try to, to map what is underneath the sand over the whole area between these two breakwaters. So we, we can reconstruct the village how it was before. Lying just off the Isle of Wight in the Solent Channel is a much older submerged landscape, discovered by divers in 1999. A decade of fieldwork by the Hampshire and White Trust has revealed that Boldner Cliff was a prehistoric settlement 8,000 years ago. At that time, lower sea levels meant that the Solent Channel was actually a wooded river the valley. Now is to go down to Boulder Cliff 5. The visibility is awful. It's maybe that much, a bit more. So you have to bear with me while I try and locate the site. Then we can get the frame and we can position it over the top of the site. Now the reason we're doing this is to give us a, a, a good foothold so that we don't get washed away when the tide changes. Also, it acts as reference points for when we start recovering some samples. And the bits we're going to recover are the peak deposit from the submerged forest that was like there. Trying to identify timber shaped by man in this labyrinth of decaying wood and compacted mud takes time and a high degree of skill. The A2S archaeologists are working together against the tide and limited visibility to remove specimens of wood, stone tools and even lengths of string for further analysis in the lab. Surprisingly, organic material from this period is better preserved here than it would be on dry land. So Boldner Cliff is all the more important to our understanding of Mesolithic Britain. So what we have here is we have this submerged landscape. It's about 8,000 years old, a bit older. There's been eroding out of this underwater cliff in the Western Solent. And why it's so significant is not just the finds that we've got there, but also that this is comparable to many other sites around Europe. I say Northwest Europe being the North Sea or the Channel, the areas that we're working in for this project. And it was within this area that we found a whole bunch of the archaeological artefacts. Okay, so here's a nice little piece of uh, uh, worked, worked flint. But this is a flake that would have been taken from a core. And once it's produced like this, you can use this as a cutting blade. Uh, and they hold, hold a series of this, and about 300 of these have been found on site. Here we have lots of burning flints and burnt flints. And very, they've been burnt in sort of fires and pits. And it's very significant because we have a lot of burning activity on the site. But in amongst these, which are very common in Mesolithic sites, we've got this organic material. And this is an example of a hazelnut found on the site. You must remember that this hazelnut wasn't from the forest from last winter, but it was actually from the forest over 8,000 winters ago. Most of this material, I'd say, has been brought up over the last couple of years within the framework of the Atlas of the Two Seas project. And we've been working with our colleagues from uh, France and Belgium, diving down on the sites, excavating and recovering and removing the material where we can. It is a site under threat as well, so if we don't work quickly, it will soon be lost. We found timbers that have been worked by humans. Uh, and here's just a range of the timbers we found. And this is quite interesting because it shows a microcosm of the site we're looking at. And this particular piece here, we believe this to have been many metres longer, now, this piece of timber was actually chopped out to form a plank using a technology that's 2,000 years 
ahead of its time. And of course, we even have string and we have the like that uh, goes with it that, that demonstrates they were tying things together at the time. So it looks like a big a sort of a manufacturing site, possibly building the logbooks of which we have the remains here. This evidence being exposed by the currents of the channel and the work of the archaeologists has established that Boulder Cliff is the earliest known boat building site in the world. More, the number of work pieces of timber we found, uh, about a quarter of the total found in the UK to date. So it's a very rich site and this is, we're only looking at one small part of it. It just shows the potential <coughs> under the sea. The English and Solent channels, so crucial for trade and commerce, are steeped in maritime history and disaster. Under the dive boat, the A2S team are working on the wreck of HMS Pomone, a 38-gun frigate launched in 1805, the year of Trafalgar. A beacon of English shipbuilding skills, she was the fastest in the British Navy. Most of the ship's exposed oak timbers have rotted away, but beneath the sediment excavated by the team, they are in remarkably good condition. Trying to orientate yourself on a wreck can be difficult, but from these copper pins, some over a meter in length, which held the ship's timbers together and the two anchor hawse pipes, you can tell you are on the bow of a British man of war. These lead hawse pipes would have prevented wear on the timbers as the anchor was raised or lowered. Archaeologists are using a metal frame to take accurate measurements and to make drawings of the timbers. This information will give maritime historians a better understanding of shipbuilding techniques of the period. It is clear from this chart printed in 1749 that the coastline was an area mariners had to navigate with extreme caution. These shallow sandbanks are like a maze and they lie off the entrance to the port of Ostend. They have claimed many ships and many lives. The Burton Rattal sandbank is where one such victim lies. The Burton Rattal uh, wreck uh, was found in the late 90s by a group of scuba divers. Um, they recovered a lot of artifacts and secondly uh, now during the A2S project we are having the opportunity to also investigate the wreck and to plan the wreck with the help of our two partners in the projects. So we are learning a lot more about the wreck for the moment during the A2S project. We are planning the site. We learned uh, that there are still more wood conserved on the site than we first thought that uh, was preserved. This ship, probably a merchantman, sank around 300 years ago. Limited visibility, combined with low temperatures and strong currents, can unnerve the most experienced of divers. So this is not a place for the faint-hearted. Working on these sites is taking archaeology to the extreme. But by sharing their skills and experience, the three nations are achieving so much more. Since we are a country with very low experience in uh, maritime archaeology, the project helps us um, to learn a lot more about uh, techniques, to learn a lot more about partners that uh, are having a lot more um, experience on the field of maritime archaeology and uh, that way we, uh, we can learn a lot, lot more about our mutual wreck sites. Identifying a wreck from the past can take years of research and investigation, especially one which is broken and scattered across the seabed. It is possible that the name of this wreck may never be known, even though it has yielded up thousands of artefacts. These objects, many of them personal, give us a window back into our past with this, a soldier's tobacco tin, engraved with a verse from the Bible, written in Dutch and illustrated with a graphic scene of bears devouring children. A brass bandolier for his primed powder and shot, And here, a pewter spoon with the maker's initials and a mark which tells us it was made in Amsterdam. Remarkably, this glass flagon, still containing wine, has survived 300 years on the seabed. 
would working tools too, like these pliers, so similar to the ones you can buy today. For the traders that filled the holds, the loss of the ship would have been a financial disaster. But for today's archaeologists, it provides a rich source of knowledge. My job is to study tree rings. And, uh, well, in another way you can call that dendrochronology. This particular uh, figurehead was uh, caught in a fishing net in the North Sea, close to an area where a Dutch trading ship uh, was found. So now we're trying to look to see if this figurehead is a part of one of those ancient shipwrecks and therefore we need a date so that's what I'm doing here I'm taking pictures of the tree rings that are visible on this particular sculpture those tree rings differ from year to year in a way that they are wider or smaller whether the growing conditions were favorable or not and that series of tree rings gives us a, a kind of a barcode that is in this particular piece of wood and when I can read and actually measure all these tree rings on this uh, particular sculpture, I can actually date this piece of wood. The age and the type of wood used in the making of this figurehead, along with the style of its carving, all help to identify when and where the ship was built. Since sailors began navigating the channel, they have had to contend with dangerous coastlines, enemies and the elements. During severe storms, these shores were deadly to sailing ships, which would venture far out into the channel to avoid them. But whether fleeing from weather or war, the fortified natural harbour of St. Malo gave protection. In the estuary, ships could sit at anchor, safe from any foe or raging storm. Today, it is a haven for a very different kind of sailor, but beneath this calm surface lies a mystery. Maritime archaeologists from Adramar are working on a French wreck from 1692. They believe it to be the César, and it carried an unusual cargo, cannon. The French research vessel, Hermine Bretagne, is positioned directly above the wreck. The A2S team is preparing to dive. The international dive team is led by Alexandre poudre barre Alexandre is coordinating the survey with Gary Momba, and Inna Demera, his English and Belgian partners. So the objective is to measure the guns uh, accurately, uh, each of them uh, with uh, measurement and fill in the guns uh, record sheets so we can have a portrait of each of the guns, try to see uh, what was their caliber, uh, nationality if we can, to try to link that to the wreck. Because we believe it's a Caesar, but it's maybe another wreck. It's just from the archive that we believe it's a Caesar, but we're not sure that that's a really the Caesar. After being immersed in salt water for over 300 years, the guns are corroding. Once back in the dive control room, Alexandra and Gary guide the survey of the cannon site. So the idea is you have the guns which are laid uh, perpendicular to the, yep. to the axis of the, of the, of the trench. Yep. So we think maybe the keel or some timbers could be in this area. So how, how deep do you think we're going to need to go? Is it clay oh, at the bottom? No, it's probably, probably a meter or something. Mm -hmm. Because uh, that's a good shot though. John, could you hold the shot on the diver doing the measuring? You've got a Brandon who's doing the measurement. 
with the yeah. surface uh, come. Okay, Foxtrot, 13 Cranion, you have that. Four, zero, five, four. They're, they're 10 or 11 cannon there. There's 11, uh, 11 gun. Hold it there, hold it there. Yeah, hold it there, John, that's good. Could you go to sondage number two? We want to look at the dredge. To make the measurements as accurate as possible, the team has secured a metal grid around the guns. From these fixed datum points, they can draw a precise plan. There are many intriguing questions about this site. Why were the guns just left? Even in 1692, they would have had the ability to salvage the valuable cannon from only 10 meters. Were they cargo, ballast, or simply jettisoned to lighten the ship? Alexander's team are hoping to find the answers to these questions by dredging a trench either side of the guns. The excavation has already revealed part of the keel and deck lying beneath the cannon and artefacts have been found in the stone ballast, giving archaeologists the belief that more personal items could still lie beneath the sand. The site still holds many of its secrets. This wreck is really linked with French history, so it's important for the global history of European countries, but it is, it's not directly linked with English, uh, English history or Belgium history. So what is link us here together is really the techniques and the science we are all, this, this archaeology world, which is the link between us. Uh, then we, we also have a project where we are linked all together in the history of the shipwreck, like the London Year, or Bulnercliffe, uh, which is a Mesolithic site, or the uh, the site of Bialclamondry in Normandy, where we worked last year all together. So those sites were prehistoric, so they belong to no country. I mean, they, they're not linked with uh, uh, contemporary country or contemporary borders, it's humankind. A wreck that truly symbolizes the shared heritage of all three Channel nations is that of the SS Londoner. This British built merchant ship, owned by a Belgian company and under charter to the French, lies at a depth of 40 meters. The steamer, over a century old, is slowly breaking apart. But looking at her twisted and broken remains, she can still transport you back to the era of the Great War. In the early hours on the 13th of March 1918, the Londoner had almost crossed the channel, but unfortunately, she had been spotted by a U-boat. UC-71 launched a surface attack from barely 200 meters away. Two torpedoes exploded on the Londoner's port side. Mortally wounded, the Londoner immediately began to sink. The crew abandoned ship. Thirteen men made it to the life rafts. Twelve did not. The sinking of the ship and the loss of these seamen would not have appeared in the press. Sunk in the final year of the Great War, such reporting was banned. No information or encouragement was to be given to the enemy. Now, things are slightly different. Pupils from Guseni School in Brittany are creating front pages of newspapers. As interest in our shared history grows, the wreck of the Londoner has become the very heart of the A2S educational project, where pupils from all three nation schools collaborate to identify the mystery wreck with their newly acquired skills as junior archaeologists. Dans ce projet, c'était intéressant de voir aussi d'avoir des liens avec bah, l'Angleterre et puis avec la Belgique, de pouvoir faire des échanges d'informations. Et puis c'est pour ça que, comme le groupe était important, puisqu'ils étaient 39, euh, c'est pour ça que j'ai choisi plutôt le système de la une, de journal, parce que comme ça, chacun pouvait faire une une. Et ensuite, l'objectif, c'est d'envoyer un mail aux différents autres élèves pour pouvoir leur proposer, leur envoyer la une, une une personnalisée pour chaque person for each who participated in this activity. One major element of this project centers on the stern gun. It's an unmistakable piece of wreckage which helped archaeologists confirm the identity of this ship. Here they are trying to measure the cannon of the ship to try to know the name of the ship and what is this ship, this ship mystery. Some pupils are producing a scaled-down drawing of the gun which links maritime research with the creation of accurate drawings. The 12-pound gun 
which never fired in retaliation during this brief, bloody encounter, now lies broken from its base. It is a reminder of the sacrifice made by so many seamen in engagements fought at sea. Like the contemporaries in Brittany, the pupils in Belgium are working on a scale drawing of the stern gun. We're doing a project. We're trying to find and identify a wreck uh, which is, lo is located near the English coastline. We're trying to find out uh, the size of it, uh, the crew members, um, the engines, what kind of engines and how many there are. We're being helped by the Flemish heritage. They are coming and trying to help the pupils, searching the websites and filling in some uh, papers about it. Oh, it's a combination of many subjects. There's history, most of them, and then there's mathematics as well because they had to learn to draw uh, a cannon. Yeah. Um, then there's also as well the language because they have to communicate with the English school and the French school as well. And then they have to collaborate, they have to work together. Now they're making a movie about it because there's an, a creative part as well at the end of the project. And um, we're trying to do it with the characters Tintin, his dog Snowy and the other characters of the comic books. And we decided to make a film of it, um, which has been named uh, The Mystery of the London Year. So the pupils will uh, discover the, the wreck. Linking the cartoon character of Captain Haddock of Tintin fame to the story of the Londoner is a creative way of learning. Onze Londoner is a stoommachine van het jaar 1870 tot 1940. Het type motor is een compound stoommachine triple expansie, drie cilinders dus. Het schip is gezonken in de Tweede Wereldoorlog het jaar 1918. Duizend bommen en granaten. 94,25 meter lang was het schip. Hoe is die gezonken? <laughs> <laughs> het is zeer interessant. En ja, ik kijk graag wat dat er eigenlijk ja, gezonken is in het water. En ja, het is heel anders. We zijn meer bezig aan het onderzoeken. En anders is het uit een cursus. Ja, we leren hoe... We onderzoekingen doen en ja, dat is zeer leuk, want het is met een groep dat, we, dat je samenwerkt. Mijn papa is een duiker en ja, ik zal dat ook wel graag doen en dan meer als archeoloog. archeoloog. The Londoner, so impressive after nearly a century underwater, lies far from shore. It can be difficult to reach her, but this haunting wreck can surprise the most experienced of divers. Like the engine, the boilers now loom above what remains of the wreckage. Finding someone to teach maritime archaeology could be a challenge in any of the three nation schools. An unorthodox way of getting around this problem is to take the experts and the classroom to the pupils. Not many would expect this. Charlie, you're a penguin now. Next question. How many masts did the ship have? These, now these were a bit of confusion for everybody. And here's what they are. Say again. It's not to burn the coal, no. There'll be a dial on the front here that's missing. Mike's not a microscope. Oh yeah, Mulberry's a tanker. That's two masts, steam driven, from the right date period. Well, that sounds brilliant job. Excellent. Right. The reason we're at this school today is the actual, the students and the teachers have formed a little maritime archaeology company. And that's what they're basing all their subjects, all their classroom subjects on at the moment, around a maritime archaeological investigation of shipwrecks and sites. And we, we fit into their, their remit perfectly with the national curriculum as well. And it's quite nice because archaeology isn't a natural, traditional school subject, but there are lots of elements within maritime archaeology that are like basic maths and physics and science and history and art. And so our job is to bring this to schools and show that, you know, learning can be really, really fun. We can say, well, look at, for example, datum offset and trilateration. 
it's maths, but measuring out a shipwreck is cool. They're learning stuff and they're doing stuff, but they don't realise that they're learning a traditional school subject. This is on the back of a sort of a series of English lessons which we've done to um, create a, an environment which the, the children are by and large in control of. Uh, and the subject area we've chosen was marine archaeology. Um, and the idea is that it produces the, the opportunities to do lots of different writing types, so um, descriptions, stories, instructions, all those sort of things. So this gives them a chance to actually see what goes on. Uh, I like the, the fact they've got all these artefacts uh, and little models that they can use, which sort of brings it to life. A lot of the teachers um, learn something themselves. A lot of the feedback is um, it was great for the kids and I actually learned something as well. It just adds an extra element and then it's all very well sitting in classrooms and you can show them your video but to actually get the hands on to things I think is, uh, certainly enriches the experience. I'm really trying to uncover the artefacts. I'm loving it. There's so many activities to do. Really? Yeah. yeah. The archaeological atlas of the Two Seas project is complete. It spans the history of all three Channel nations and integrates our common European heritage from prehistoric times to the present day. The Atlas, original in concept and design, is accessible to all those passionate about the maritime heritage of their shared seas. The exchange of knowledge, research and practical experience between the partners has created this unique resource. As the three nations move forward into the future, together, they are building a new way of looking at their past. <laughs>